especially if he settled the problem, because if he can tell you how when he encountered some unexplored territory he was able to sew it back together then maybe you can do that when that thing happens, and that's pretty cheap wisdom for you it's, he had to go through all the aggravation of figuring it out, and all you have to do is listen you know, and that's kind of a classic story the classic story, roughly speaking, is there's a guy, woman, doesn't matter going about their life relatively normally something blindsides them and they're in a state of chaos chaos is a place chaos is the place that you end up when what you're doing and the world stop matching and the chaos can be of different degrees you know, you could wake up and find that your house was burgled, you could wake up and find that a parent has, your parent has Alzheimer's or some fatal disease, or that you do or that your whole family was murdered, or that there's a war starting, or, you know there's different degrees of chaos, and I think you can quantify the chaos by calculating how much of what you do and expect is likely to be disrupted by the event now, because that, the more disruption, the more destabilized you're going to be, which is why if someone tells you that you're going to perish painfully in three months, it's like that's a bad one you're really in an unexpected territory, there are nothing that you assumed that was real, roughly speaking, in the world is real anymore we like to watch people in their normal life blindsided by something experiencing this interregnum of chaos, where they explore and gather new information and retool their character, or retool the world, because you could, either of those would work as a solution and then come out the other side and things are better than they were to begin with or at least as good, but better is better, that's a happy ending, right? that's a happy ending, that's a comedy, technically speaking and so, what you want, you want your life to be a comedy not that it's supposed to be funny, because comedy doesn't have to be funny, technically speaking it's just the opposite of tragedy tragedy is when you're going along pretty well, and you get blindsided, and that's that and, you know, that can certainly happen, it happens to people all the time but it's a comedy you want now what I hope to provide you with is a, a magic code you know, there was a book published a while back Tom Hanks was in the movie he was a Harvard professor who went around solving symbolic mysteries do you remember, what, what was it called? The Da Vinci Code, everyone liked that it sold a lot and you know, it was full of little mysteries and it was full of hints that there was more to the world than you think and which is definitely true and that, you know, there was a way of getting access to that knowledge and that it would really be worthwhile and people like that, they like that idea and the reason for that is because it's actually, it's true it's true it's true like like fiction is true, so okay, let's go back to the guy who's telling you about his morning well, he tells you something exciting well, then imagine that ten people tell you something exciting and then you extract out the pattern of them dealing with this problem from that, and so then you have a that's what you do if you're an author right, because in a, in a book you don't want the book exactly to be about what ordinary people do in ordinary times in their life it's like, you already know how to be ordinary during ordinary times of your life what, that's not useful you know, you wouldn't watch a videotape of yourself imagine you videotaped yourself during a day, and then the next day you watched that it's like, God, who would want to do that? so what seems to happen in stories is that they distill they distill so they, they watch people, people watch people and then they tell stories about what they see, but they leave a lot out of those stories everything that's boring, hopefully and then more and more stories about exciting things get sort of aggregated, and then maybe a great writer comes along and writes something really, really interesting profound character transformations and then you say, well that's fiction 
and then you say, well that's not true because it's fiction but then, then maybe that's not right maybe it's more than true because who wants the truth? the truth is mundane reality and you've already got that mastered what you want is the distillation of interesting experience and you might think, well why is it interesting? well that's a really good question because you don't actually know and believe me, you really don't know because you'll be interested in things that just don't make any sense at all I'm going to walk you a bit today through Pinocchio and we'll do that more the next time too you know, but I want to tell you a little bit about that movie to begin with just so you know how crazy you are so you know the plot, how many people have seen the Disney movie Pinocchio? okay, so lots of people, so that's strange enough in itself that so many people have seen it and it's worth thinking about, you know, you tend to show your kids that movie and, but you think about the movie, it's you're doing some pretty weird things when you're sitting there watching that movie, man first of all, it's drawings right, and they're low resolution drawings, you don't care and you watch The Simpsons or maybe, Fe or uh, what's that called? The, the one that's been concentrating on political correctness so much South Park, South Park. God, that animation, man, it's just awful Right? It's just horrible. It couldn't be worse. You don't care. Like round heads, smile, a little bit of shuffling. That's a person as far as you're concerned. It's just irrelevant. And if it was higher resolution, it wouldn't help. You just need the bare bones, right? To hang your perceptions on. So So you watch this drawing, that's Pinocchio. Beautiful drawings. Animated in a sequence you're not watching something real, you're watching a pure construction and then you think about the plot, it's like it's completely absurd, everything about it is absurd it's like, well, one of the characters is a bug and he turns out to be like the conscience and so what the hell is with that and then another character is this puppet, marionette and, you know, somehow he gets free of his strings and then goes on this adventure and then, which is and then, you know, he gets enticed into various nefarious places by a fox and a cat and then he rescues his father from a whale and you don't even know how his father got in the whale it's like the last time you see his father, he was in a rainstorm and the next thing that happens is, he's in a whale and you're sitting there thinking, hey, no problem, this all makes sense it's like, what? Really? Why? How does that make sense? well, the answer is, you don't know that's the thing that's so cool you don't know, you don't even know what you're watching but it doesn't matter you watch it and you're interested in it you want to see what the hell happens to this puppet you want to see if he ends up becoming a real boy because there's... it seems important well, you say, well, is Pinocchio true? well, that's a stupid question It's partly a stupid question because the answer is it depends on what you mean by true. And it isn't obvious to me what you should mean when you say that something's true. And I, the reason it's not obvious is because we have this idea in our society, and it's a, it's a very profound idea, and that idea is that the ultimate truth is scientific truth that that tells us that about the nature of the world and it does that in, in a final way in some sense there's no brooking any arguments about it and the physicists have got it right and that's why they can make hydrogen bombs and that's a pretty good demonstration of their being right but you don't act as if that's true and you don't and you watch things and pay attention to things and are captivated by things that aren't predicated on those assumptions and it seems to me that there is a problem of what the world is made out of but there's a bigger problem and that's the problem of how you should conduct yourself in the world and that's really what you want to know people want to know that more than anything because you need to know, it's like, here you guys are in university, it's like, you don't know what you're doing I mean, some of you know more than others, but you're at the beginning of your life and life is very complex and chaotic and 
it isn't exactly obvious, you know, how, what kind of relationship you should form or what sort of character you should develop or what you're going to do for a job or how, what's the meaning of life, that's a good one, what's the meaning of life? Well, and you know, people come to university, at least many of them, and that's kind of what they want to find out Now, Paglia, her notion is that you could think about it this way, is that articulated knowledge is embedded in inarticulate knowledge and inarticulate knowledge is the domain of literature and art and, and high culture, let's say and it's, we sort of know what it means but we don't exactly know what it means, it means more than we know and then outside of that is what we don't know at all and that's an idea that Jung developed as well, and maybe Paglia picked it up from Jung, because Jung believed that you know, there was this domain that we had mastered in, in every domain, and then there, were, there was a domain outside of that, which you could think of as unexplored territory and the, what we met unexplored territory with was our creative imagination and that what we were trying to do with our creative imagination is to figure out how to deal with that unexplored territory we were producing dramas that we could act out, that would help us deal with what we still hadn't mastered and then outside of that, there's just what we don't know at all and Paglia's idea, and this was Jung's idea was that without understanding that surround you're too atomized you're not part of your historical tradition you haven't incorporated the spirit of your ancestors and who built all this you're, you're just here now and, and you don't know what to do either and you don't know how to maintain your culture and you don't know how to serve it and you know, you might say, well why should you serve your culture? and, well I have a hypothesis about that you know, you can think about this, I don't know if it's true but people ask what the meaning of life is and it seems to me that meaning is proportionate to the adoption of responsibility you know, like, let's say you have a little sister who's like three and you're going to take care of her like, questioning whether that's a good idea just seems stupid you know what I mean, it just doesn't seem like the right kind of question it's like, well, obviously self-evidently, let's say, that's what you do and do you find it meaningful? it's like, probably you know, interacting with a little kid when, when we, when I had little kids, you know, when they were like two or under we took them out to see their relatives and they were older people and you know, they watched that two-year-old like, like it was a fire you know, every second that that little kid was in the room every single adult was focused on, focused on, on him or her that, that's something that people attend to and that's a source of meaning and what else is meaningful? well, your family relationships are meaningful to you and maybe the responsibility that you adopt as, as a friend, that, that seems meaningful maybe your decision to pursue a particular career and be of some utility in society you know, part of that's governed by your desire to establish some security and get ahead, it's fine, but you're also playing an integral role in the maintenance of the structure that supports you and my observation has been that in my clinical practice is that people just have a hell of a time if they don't have if they don't slot in somewhere, you know you know, you think, oh, I gotta go to work at nine in the morning and you know, I've got this rigid schedule, it's like it's probably a good idea to be grateful for that, because what I've noticed is that if people pull out from those externally scaffolded systems they drift they get depressed, they get anxious they don't know what to do with themselves you know, they're kind of like sled dogs with no sled and we're kind of like sled dogs, as far as I can tell, beasts of burden like, we need a load, man we need a load and the question is, what, what sort of load do you need? And here's why I think we need, we need that. You know, there's 
I've been thinking about how to figure out